Hello and welcome to Lamplighter. Today is March 29. Today we start to read more and more about the exploits of Saul as king of Israel. Once again, he is Israel's first king in this newly established monarchy. Now Saul is 30 years old when he becomes king, and he reigns in Israel roughly 40 years. When you read in the book of Acts, and the history is given of the Old Testament kingship, you read of Saul reigning for 40 years. I think that number must be rounded off because here in the text today, we're told that Saul becomes king when he's 30 years old and he reigns in Israel for 42 years. But that's not an important point. The point is this, Saul is a human and because he's human, he's fallible. This is a different kind of kingship than Israel has ever had before, and we're going to start to see some of the fallibilities of Saul in today's reading. First, we're told that Jonathan, the son of Saul, attacks a Philistine outpost. Now, the Philistines are constant enemies of the Israelites, so Jonathan and his armor bearer are going to have a role to play in several battle scenes in today's reading. First, we're told that Jonathan attacks a Philistine outpost. It's kind of like stirring up a hornet's nest, you might say, as now the Philistines have been stirred up. They are angry. They're going to retaliate. They're going to come out in battle array against the Israelites. Now, the Philistines have a pretty powerful and formidable appearing army. And so Saul recognizes that he is now being threatened. He gets an army together from among the Israelites. But the problem here is that we're told the Philistines are as numerous as the sand on the seashore. That's an interesting terminology because that's the same terminology God had used many years earlier to describe Abraham's descendants in his promise. They'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Now that expression is being used to describe the vast numbers in the Philistine army. The Israelites are dramatically outnumbered, and so because of that, they start to panic a little bit. They're starting to hide in caves, and they're trying to scatter out and make sure they're not easy targets, and so on. And Saul starts to panic. He summoned his army together, but now he sees while they're waiting for Samuel to appear and appeal to the Lord on their behalf through an offering, Saul starts to see his men panic. He starts to see them scatter. And so he panics, and in his panic, offers the burnt offering himself. He gets tired of waiting for Samuel. But that's a huge, huge mistake. Let's look at the reading again at the top of page 400. Saul replies to Samuel when Samuel challenges him on this, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time, it's as though he's blaming Samuel here, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I've not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Notice all the rationalizations that are happening in Saul's mind. He has violated the command of God. He has offered an offering that Samuel was supposed to offer, and now he's trying to make it Samuel's fault or It was simply what he had to do in order to be a good king and to gain the Lord's favor. Let's read on. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Twice in this one paragraph, Samuel says to Saul, you could have done it, you could have been successful, but you violated the Lord's command. You did not obey God. What have we said all through our reading, all the way back to Genesis? When a person obeys God, God blesses him. When a person disobeys, God punishes The same is true here of Saul. And Samuel is saying, you know what? If you had simply obeyed God, he would have blessed you. You would have been richly rewarded. But instead, 
you are not going to be king anymore. So the Israelites are going to be going against the Philistines, and we're told that the Philistines have an interesting battle strategy, including the weapons. The, it, the Philistines have made sure the Philistines have, excuse me, the Philistines have made sure the Israelites have no blacksmiths, so they're not able to even fashion any weapons. As a matter of fact, the text goes on to tell us that the Israelites are dependent upon the Philistines for even sharpening the weapons they have. That's a huge battle disadvantage, a great strategy on the part of the Philistines. It looks like everything favors them. In the meantime, we're told that Jonathan and his armor bearer have a conversation, and Jonathan says, let's go up to the Philistine outpost near us and let's see what's happening there. And when they see us, if they say, come on up to us, we'll show you a thing or two, then we'll know God has delivered them into our hands. But if they stay, say, you stay where you are, and we'll come to you, we'll know that God has not delivered them into our hands. And the armor bearer basically says to, to Jonathan, do whatever you think is right, and I'll go with you. And so Jonathan even says, perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Jonathan is very aggressive. He is taking matters into his own hands, believing that God will lead him in victory. So he and the armor bearer make themselves visible. The Philistines in this outpost say, come on up to us and we'll defeat you. Jonathan takes that as a sign from God. He and his armor bearer go and attack the Philistines. And certainly with the hand of God working with them, they kill 20 men in the space of about a half acre, the text says. They're victorious, but now the battle is on. And now the Philistines are riled up once again. But God works in the army of the Philistines to cause a panic among them. And they turn on each other and they kill each other. And the text tells us once again, the story is not about Jonathan, his armor bearer, or the Philistine army. It's not even about Saul. The story is about God. And the Lord rescued Israel that day from the hand of the Philistines. Now, in the meantime, we're told that Saul had given an order to his men that no one was to take any food. And as a result, they're trying to focus on the battle, but they're getting weak. Jonathan doesn't know about the order. And so when he sees some honey on the ground, he takes it and gives himself some needed energy. When the other men in the army see that, they know that he's violated Saul's order. When Saul finds out, he's going to kill his own son, Jonathan, for violating his command. Saul is so confused about what's truly important here. Finally, the men in the Israelite army come to Jonathan's defense and rescue him. But we start to see the little by little deterioration of Saul as king. He's a great army commander, but he keeps failing to understand what's truly important. He keeps violating God's commands and ultimately it's going to cost him. I want us to use this moment to remind ourselves when we allow ourselves to slowly deteriorate in our relationship with God, when we grow further distant from him each day, when we find ourselves failing to obey his commands, we're on a downward slope and God will punish that kind of response. He wants to reward us. He wants to bless us, but he expects us to be obedient. Isn't it great to be a lamplighter? His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I hope you have a blessed day.